So welcome back to the Redacted Culture Cast. If you have been waiting for this episode to come out, uh, or if you've noticed that we took a week away from recording, the objective, or I'm sorry, from publishing, uh, the objective was to retool and recenter ourselves on what our goals, objectives, and methods are for this idea that we're calling Redacted. <laughs> now, the one, one, one opportunity to look behind the veil is to recognize that we're going to say this. The objective and one of the deficiencies that we've noticed within gun culture, let's see, the objective that we have before us is to identify and fix and eliminate a deficiency that we've seen in both gun culture and America in the West, and that is that we are very equipped when it comes to the physical tools of our defense, but the war that is being waged or the conflict that we're facing in many ways is one of ideas. And so while we live in a world with plenty of information to be gathered, uh, it's the evaluation of information that will be our downfall. So as a, uh, uh, now that we're back to the show, I will still have my guest introduce himself. Would you go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Jake and I'm the founder of Gridbase. And uh, Gridbase is, is uh, uh, a encompassing, all encompassing uh, device that kind of speaks to what you were talking about in the intro. And that's what we're going to get down and dirty with today. Gotcha. Yeah. You and I had a conversation over social media, which is another tool. And we let that led us to this part, where, this place where yeah. we're at now. So um, before we get started, this show is a the show, as we're talking about, the Redacted Culture Cast, is actually supported, provided by uh, you, the audience, right now as this is live. We are selling off the rest of our Moons Haunted stuff. Uh, the idea, the purpose behind Moons Haunted is, it's, as it says on the front, as below, so above, is that the rights that are placed on the individual are also placed on the government. The, there is no difference between man and man when we are talking about our population. So the limitations that the government has, though, are greater than us. If the government is going to be able to, say, spy on us, we should have some recourse of grievances to look upwards, if you want to say it that way, and understand what they're doing because we are all people. That is this idea of the moon's haunted. It's not that we're, well, I don't know how you can say it. In, uh, there are plenty of other ways you can say it, but the objective is in the crypt, in, in its cryptic nature, we want peace between the population and our government. I thought, you said, meant it, I thought you meant it literally. I thought it was the moon's actually haunted. Kind of scared me for a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, I there there's this idea. I guess it, you know it comes from a couple of things, and the joke is that you know, I, I, the moon's. It, I think it was a, a joke from like a Destiny thing from a long time ago. But the whole idea behind it is this idea of ghosts, and and if we are going to go settle the stars, maybe we're going to find that the uh, powers that be aren't really the good guys. So we'll see how it goes. That being the case, um, so go. Would you mind introducing, telling a little bit of the story about Gridbase and this device that we've kind of gone back and forth over a little bit? And totally. Let's get started because the I think it. Yeah. I think I think it, once you once you understand what it is, it's gonna it's gonna really open up. Explain why it's here itself. Yeah, to understand what it is, you've got to understand where it came from, and so we'll just kind of kill two birds with one stone in this aspect. So. Um, I've, I've ever since learning about the Library of Alexandria, I've been obsessed with the idea of protecting, you know, having repositories of information. And, um, you know, that kind of presented itself in college with some friends of mine that, that uh, we started a website called Safana.world. And it's just a collaboration and a collection of a ton of music that we've curated, you know, over the last six or seven years. And we always wanted a physical, you know, manifestation of that discography and to keep it somewhere safe so that in the event of a societal collapse, there would still be music. We always found that music was like the center of every culture and to really bring community back, you would need music. And um, so there's that aspect of it, you know, and then there's there's the aspect that uh, we, we live in this time where we're so dependent upon information and and. Uh, 
having all of it at our fingertips. It, it's like we've lost the old way of knowing to do things, knowing how to sew a button on a shirt or, or skin something. And many of our fathers or forefathers even were disconnected from that. And so we didn't get that. So we're having to reteach ourselves those things. And we had, you know, in the, in the later stages or middle stages, whatever you call it, of gun culture 3.0, you had a lot of people talking about sustainment and getting out and figuring out how to use a compass and orienteering and and all of those things. And that was about the time that I got into gun culture because prior to that, I was a, you know, a hippie and I was actually like really anti guns and all of that for a long time, but I was from Texas. So it was kind of, um, you know, just being different <laughs> to not like guns or something at the time. But, um, in college I moved into a van and I started living in a van full time for like two years. And it was during that time that I got to spend a lot of time alone, listening to my own voice and, um, really kind of taking stock of what mattered and what was important going forward. And uh, obviously guns became a part of that simply for the security of being in a van. And then I was fortunate to have a friend who was very, very into gun culture at that time and still is. And he really just showed me the way into the reality of the situation. And I saw it for everything that it was. And I had come from a background of camping and overlanding and all of that prior to. so. Gun Culture 3.0 lining up with my background and camping and sustainment, if you want to call that, call it that. It was like those thing, things just married really well. And it was in the van that I had this concept initially come about uh, for grid base. And a lot of it was based off of ham radio. And I didn't really know much about ham radio at the time. And when I got into the van, I started realizing that there was a bunch of like emergency channels that were out in the middle of the woods. And that if you didn't have cell phone service, you could tap into those and, and receive help and, and be rescued. So I naturally got a Baofeng UV5R and started studying for my technician license. And that began my radio obsession. And then I got into understanding more about APRS, the automated packet reporting system. And the fact that you could send text messages over that in digital modes. And I just got lost in how cool that was. And especially at that time in my life, being in the van uh, in the mountains, there was a lot of times where I didn't have signal. And so I was getting to practice some of those things at a very small level. And, um, and it was about that time that a guy named Jay Dosher came along with his Raspberry Pi quick kit, uh, which was a, a Pelican with you know a Raspberry Pi in it. And his was much different in, in what it was designed to do. Um, but nonetheless, I just saw it and was like, I need that. That fits, that fits my life. And that was in like 2018 or something. You kind of step on down the line and a lot of things had evolved for, from the technology aspect of actually being able to make a Raspberry Pi in a box a reality. And then for me personally, things had evolved where I actually kind of needed one. My wife was... Uh, pregnant and about to give birth to our son. And I was just kind of, you know, we had gone through COVID and all of the chaos of, you know, cell towers not working in certain areas and being shut down and hospitals being overrun. And my wife was nesting and doing all of that. And I thought like, okay, I need to have some kind of contingency here um, in the event that that happens again and my son's born. And so that was really the fire that kind of like pushed me into creating it. And uh, at first, I was just ripping off of Jay Dosher's Quick Kit, and then I ended up finding a lot of flaws in Jay Dosher's ki uh, Quick Kit, and then I started grabbing at you know some of the different radio aspects, and it just became this wormhole of me staying up for 24 hours, like three days in a row, and just digesting all of this, you know, new information to me, and actually, because I've you know you'd seen a bunch of it, but actually putting your hands on it and learning programming, because I'm a knuckle dragon Texan, I was not a Silicon Valley computer programmer, I'm a much more uh, motorcycle riding grease monkey type person. And so to get my head into the programming aspect was very new. And so it, kind of learning what the capabilities were and spiraled, you could say it spiraled off into this ultimate where I was like, man, a lot of people could use this technology for a lot of different things. And, um, and it, and it forced me to, to push grid base to where it is today, where initially it was just, you know, for my own needs in that moment. And I'll, I'll never forget my uh, my dad came over and I was really excited to show him because my family is uh, is missionaries. My father's a director of a of a, you know whatever you call it missions group, and I grew up in the mission field and so I'm familiar with what he does and and what it looks like in third world countries and all the different education and stuff that they require and the limited access that they have to those sorts of things. 
So I was really excited to show him in the beginning and he came over and I showed him and he was like, this is terrible. I couldn't use this. <laughs> and, uh, he was right. And I took what he said and I made a new user interface for it. And then I took it to my best friend from college and I showed him and he was like, this is terrible. You need to make a user interface for it. And so it just kind of kept evolving where I kept going back. And then I finally was like committed to making a really simple to use interface on a Linux based computer to where anyone, the, the ultimate goal by the end of the design was that if somebody found this box in the middle of nowhere and they had no reference point and no context for what it was, that upon turning it on, if they could figure out how to turn it on and plug it in, that from that point they would be able to understand and use the device very simply, whether they had a reference point for technology at all or whether they had a reference point for Linux at all, I wanted it to just be very clear of what the product did and how you could take advantage of it because uh, the ultimate goal is community re rehabilitation. And um, and so I kind of wanted to focus it on, on, yeah, let's say your not tech guy comes up and picks it up. How's he going to feel about it? And is it going to be useful to him? And so that pushed it into its current state where, where now you have a very capable, uh, deployable information grid that can be put up in, in a disaster event or in a cabin or for off-roaders, can be put up anywhere for communications or for a local internet repository or for communicating actually over chat and like text message type things or weather information, all of those things, um, you know, orienteering yourself, all of that can now be accessed very simply from this device without any external connection, um, just being able to plug it in. And so that's, that's you know, it's where we started and it's, and it's where we are. Yeah, so the yeah, the what caught my attention with your product, your device, <clears throat> is that uh, it's not simply that it, it was new. Because I, I started looking, into, I, I, as I've been going down this journey for the last months and years now, my, I, I can look back on my own life experiences, um, Minneapolis during the riots, uh, Ranger Battalion, stuff like this. And... There's this interesting disconnect that oftentimes comes up between you know, people and their things. Is that is is and this is kind of a to close it off quickly. There's a weird rate. There's a re weird kind of stigma, kind of conversation between being technologically in integrated and and being kind of like the hero character. And I know that sounds really strange, but. Uh, you look at it the way that our, our kind of our culture views the main characters and stories and novels and stuff. It's like he's usually got somebody who's like a sidekick who's like the tech guy. Um, can I can I touch on this for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, during the sustainment rally, uh, I was kind of you know I don't have the resources to practice all that stuff, right? And so it started. This is another aspect of of how it came about. Was like I kind of started thinking like, okay. Who am I going to be in this, in this like mythical scenario, right? Like yep. This guy's got nods over here, and this guy's got. You're talking about that main character philosophy. It's like this guy's got nods. This guy's like super strong, right? This guy over here knows everything about orienteering. This guy's like a, a got a got a sass rifle, and he's like killing it with, you know, like the long range shooting. And you have all you had all these different pockets of like who you were in in gun culture 3.0. And I think even like Seaburn and Art, which I love their podcast, I remember them doing like some kind of, you know, they do the illustrations and stuff. And I vaguely remember like one of their illustrations, and it was like the different types of people in you know who you are in, in gun culture and whatever. And that idea was just kind of proliferating throughout. And I realized, like, I'm not going to be the sharpest shooter. I'm not going to be the strongest guy. I'm not going to be the super linguist that can communicate everything or, or the doctor. Like, none of those are going to be me in this mythical scenario. And some of that led to, to grid base as well, like, being a thing. Because it's like, okay, well, the guy that has all the information is a pretty good resource to have. And, like, less on the main character thing, but also about, like, providing value in your community in a disaster situation, regardless of where or what it is. Like, I wanted to be someone that was contributing to the unit. I didn't want to be a person that was just kind of like, I brought my rifle, you know. I wanted to be contributing to my neighborhood or my family or my church or just whatever. Wherever I found myself, I wanted to make sure that I was a good community member. And so, that like, that, it just ultimately answers that question where... I didn't feel like it had been answered well previously, but there's a little bit to your point with the main character thing and the objects and who you are.
I've, I brought it up in an earlier episode on specialization versus decentralization. And so in, <clears throat> in how we think about ourselves is that, it, it, and I think one part of what CBRN was calling gun culture 3.0 is, is, is that we're focusing a little bit more on like being a part of something as opposed to individual skill sets. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd make a personal argument against the idea of hyper specialization in the, in the sense of we have this idea that like, oh, we've got the sniper and we've got the breacher and we've got the tech guy and we've got the medic. And it's like those things are all great skill sets to have. They right. are. And being able to bring those to the table. But when, one of the things we're also that is intent, one of the, the that idea, that kind of core idea that different people are going to have different specialties which is natural because no one person can do everything needs to be in tension with what are you expected to be able to do this kind of every marine's a rifleman mentality or every american mm -hmm. is a is, is a is a blank mentality and that's where it comes into values like what are our values when it comes to what should every person be able to do and what i think we need to um I need you to I need you to explain everything that this that your small computer does or not everything but really start addressing all of those because it, it, in some ways I think I I was looking to solve a problem I was looking to solve an objective on my end and this is how I le what led me to you is that I was looking to try to create or thinking of some sort of solution to the problem of surveillance uh counter surveillance issues surveillance counter surveillance as well as communications and sort of building this scenario in my head on, on what i would want to do it and then instead of as i started looking into it more i found somebody like you who you've already done the work you've built the thing and so now i'm in a position where i get to sit back and go okay let's 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 do it let's let's yeah. tell you right i like yeah it. so but before I get into it, I want to say, because I think there's this general, at least, uh, you know, like you said, you were kind of already on the tip of, of uh, off-grid computing, but for the average person, maybe not. And so before we dive into the technical aspects, I just kind of want to compare it to 3D printing and how it sounded too good to be true. And then all of a sudden in 2017, people were 3D printing guns and they worked and now it's insane and we all know about that. Um, really, 3D printing had been evolving since the late 70s. And so grid base is much like that in the fact that like all that's been done at this point is combined a bunch of technologies that have already been evolving and put them in a really concise, easy to use format. Um, so then we'll break down some of those different things that it does. But I just wanted to give people the scope here that like none of this is really new. The only new thing about it is all of these things being housed reliably in one package. And uh, perhaps what's new is our awareness of things. Uh, and our awareness of a need for counter surveillance and surveillance, like you mentioned earlier. And so um, we're becoming yeah. aware of, of these things that are in the zeitgeist now. Yeah. So the zeitgeist, I mean, uh, okay, spirit of the age. What is the spirit of the age? Well, I think, I think the spirit of our current age is uncertainty. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Like we just, perfect. Th there is no, there is the only thing that we know is that we don't know anything. And it's a really right. weird thing to say. Like, the yeah. the we our generation you know or, or, or a lot of us are living in a time where quite frankly uncertainty is the status quo we don't mm -hmm. know if the dollar is going to be around soon we don't know whether or not our you know like you got all these other questions right and and some right. of that also flows into issues with like multiculturalism and deleting all the rules and trying to feel like we live in a world that has rules and and then just mooring from reality right so what I thought, this is, but going back to your point, the cell phone is a tool, this, the, you know, your, 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 your cell phone that people have in their hands is a tool that before there, I remember a time before the cell phone where you had a, an MP3 player of some sort, you had a camera of some sort, you had a, you had maybe a flip phone of some sort. And so if you were going to go around anywhere, and if I was going to leave the house and I, I remember, you know, being young, being even, you know, like 25 or not 25, sorry, being like seven, 17 years old. And if I was going to go out of my house, I had to bring five or six items. And now and then fast forward four years, they're all in one item. Now, sure, the phone, the camera that I use on my phone, despite what the ads on the television say, 
is still going to be different than a more professional grade camera. Right. But now I have a data collection tool, right? Mm -hmm. And so how many times am I using that camera on my phone to save notes and, and data points so that I don't forget it? Right. Case, you know, and so like, or, or so I can hold on to that. And so that is a, that is an example that that's kind of a, a paraphrasing example. Cause as I'm looking into, as I've been looking into more of like more of our capabilities as, as citizens, um, you're stuck with things like radios and, and drones and all these different tools. And you're trying to find a purpose for them or you right. have problems that you need to solve. And so you want, I want, I, you know, I, I, what brought me to this table was, well, you mean this does all these things already and it's ruggedized yeah. so that I don't have to worry about it. So let's yeah, start. So let's dive into the specifics. I want to start with radio uh, because it's so big. Is that all right with you? Yeah, I, I basically have six categories that I'm interested in. One of them is radio. Um, one of them would be surveillance. In other words, how can I find other communications? How can I? So one of them is radio would be how do I communicate? Another one would be how do I observe? How do I counter being observed? Then the fourth one would be how do I expand current capabilities that I have or I'm trying to expand like IE drones? And then the fifth one would be you know, like what are what am I missing basically? If I can think of the five things off the top of my head. Well, let's let's tackle the first four. So what's interesting and what I love about the first four is that they can all be tackled with radio. So um, you know, the the first one being just the ability that radio has, everything uses radio frequencies. So your ability to interact with the world around you, whether that's surveillance or counter surveillance or uh, communication or any of those basic things that's all just built off of radio waves. So SDR stands for software defined radio. Listeners may or may not be familiar with that. But SDR is, this is what I love about SDR is that it's as simple or as complex as you need it or want it to be. And for a very little amount of money, you can expand your knowledge base and the usefulness of that tool nearly infinitely. And so SDR uses a dongle to transform radio signals into digital signals that you can then interpret on a graphical user interface. And so using different filters, you can eliminate certain radio frequencies. Using other filters, you can amplify other radio frequencies. And so all of these things are built off of connectors. It's actual permanent solid hardware. So you have an SDR connector connected to a FM filter. So you filter out all the FM and then you have a low noise amplifier. And so now you're able to reach signals uh, thousands, tens of thousands of miles away. And so a couple of the ways that, that this is uh, advantageous is uh, I'll take ADSB because it's a pretty uh, simple example and one that I'm familiar with. So in 2017 or 16, um, in response to 9-11 actually happening, the FAA determined that by a certain date, every aircraft everywhere would need an ADSB transponder, ADSB out transponder, which is the automatic data and surveillance broadcasting system. And so that transponder is constantly just sending out a beacon at a certain frequency. And it's used by other aircraft to intercept aircraft. So there's when there's traffic in the sky, they can know where each other's at. And it's also used by uh, air traffic control towers to identify where a particular aircraft is and um, what its altitude is, what its speed is, and all of that. And the great thing about ADSB is that even as pilots, you can opt in. It's required for you to have ADSB out if you own an airplane, but it's optional to have ADSB in. And ADSB in lets you see the traffic in your area almost in real time. Of course, there's a refresh rate, but it's pretty close. And the interesting thing about ADSB and all of that is that it's just a radio frequency and it happens to be a radio frequency that we can tap into using software defined radio or SDR. And so that gives you the ability then to track any aircraft because every aircraft is supposed to have an ADSB transponder on it unless it very particularly does it, is, is not required to have one. And so that's an interesting, you know, you got to use your imagination here. So if every aircraft around you and you have SDR pulled up and you're receiving ADSB out signals and you're seeing and, you know, these programs are actually giving you the tail number of the aircraft, the altitude of the aircraft, the approximate speed of the aircraft. If it's an airliner or if it's a freighter, it'll come up and say FedEx United. So you're getting all of this information off of that transponder and that radio frequency. And one of the ways that it could be used as surveillance or counter surveillance is that obviously the 
the tracking of airplanes. But now if you have a either a helicopter or an airplane in your AO that's not putting out ADSB, that can put you on alert for why it's not putting out ADSB. And maybe then it's something that you can pay more attention to. And now it's something of interest. So in a sea of dozens of of planes flying over you in a particular area, it's all very normal. But this one in particular continually flies over and isn't transponding anything. That's very, very abnormal because it is an automatic required protocol for flying any airplane. So um, that's one example of um, you know how you could unpack one aspect of radio to do the job that we're talking about. Um, I want to continue on, and I have more to say on that. But but before I do, I wanted to know if you had any questions on that particular aspect specifically. No, uh, not I don't need a question on it specifically. This is going down. No, just continue. Actually, okay, just yeah, continue. Yeah, so so we've tackled S, we've tackled the, what SDR is, and we've tackled one of the capabilities being you know the ADSB communication, um, and and that in and of itself. Another one that I would say is that you know when you're using SDR, as I mentioned, it's putting these things in a graphical user interface. And what I mean by that is that it's actually, you're seeing the radio waves themselves. And one of the ways that people have used SDR with this capability is by getting directional antennas, direction finding antennas, and using that graphical interface to point their antenna in a particular direction. And because of this GUI, you can see stronger radio signals in particular directions. When you see a stronger radio signal in a particular direction, obviously that gives you an idea of the fact that something's happening in that area, but it also gives you the ability to tune your antenna towards that area for those radio frequencies specifically to be able to detrunk and listen to those radio frequencies. So it gives you a better idea of, uh, it gives you a better ability to tune your radio to hear the things that, that uh, you wanna hear. But like I said, it's, it's doing two things. It's not only giving you that information, so that you can decode it, it's also giving you the ability to visually see where things are happening at in the radio sphere. Um, another way that, that I found really interesting is that you know people are able to track satellites. Uh, a customer the other day was sending me a video of a NOAA 15 satellite that he was tracking that was like super far away. And using QGIS, he was able to, once it got in 7,000 miles from him, he was able to track it on QGIS, which is a software that allows you to see the world and what the trajectory of that satellite is, again, all using radio frequencies. He was able to track down that particular NOAA 15 satellite. And once it got within range of his particular unit, he was then able to collect data from that satellite and transpond that into a visual image of weather forecasts and different things. And speaking of weather forecasts, you know, there's also the, the NOAA radio channels that people use to get weather information that are broadcast all throughout the United States. And so you can use it for something as simple if you're not trying to get all the way into direction finding antennas and tracking satellites, even the, the simplest form, you could just tune into one of those NOAA weather stations and be able to listen to you know the incoming weather and be able to plan what's happening around you. The thing about SDR that, that I appreciate the most, unlike a lot of things um, that we're faced with all the time, is that it's very inexpensive to grow with it. You know, it's it's one of these things where it can meet you where you're at and what your skill set is currently. And as you begin to come up with different needs and different uses for it, there is a very inexpensive and um, easily learnable way to go about accomplishing that task with STR. It's very, very deep. And, and you know, that's just receiving. That's just that's just receiving the information. You get into digital radio modes and actually communicating through APRS, and you can send a text message through APRS. Um, you can download weather packets from APRS. Once you get into actually transceiving or TX, you know that's like a whole other world in and of itself. Where now you're talking to people, uh, you know, thousands of miles away. But everything we're talking about with SDR is just about receiving information and how we communicate and translate that information that we receive. And I, I love SDR so much because there's no barrier to entry from a legal or technical side. Um, obviously, to transmit in those types of frequencies, you have to have a license, which is by no means hard to get, but can be a barrier to entry for some people. And maybe you don't even know that you're interested in it yet. And so why would you go spend the time to learn and get a license for something you're not interested in? SDR is a great way to get your feet wet with all of these different capabilities to hopefully get you to the point where you're ready to TX and transmit 
And now you have a better understanding of the radio sphere that you're living in. And ultimately it will allow you to succeed uh, tenfold when you get into actually transmitting that, that data. Yeah. So I think that's, that's kind of been, well, that's even the, that's even the worst introduction. Sorry. That's the worst. That is the worst way to step along. Hey man, we're human. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it's whatever. I'm a knuckle dragon Texan dude. There's no big words over here. No big words. Yeah. Oh, I went to school for big words. So I could. Oh, talk man. That's to you. that's what happened to you, man. It fried your brain in them schools. <laughs> it fried my brain in them schools. So, yeah, the there's. Let's go with this way. I think using a parallel to a cell phone, I think, makes some sense in, in the idea of when we think about communications and what we're talking about, what you're talking about as far as the capabilities of a device with radio is that. It's not going to be a one-to-one -one analog uh, for switching from a cell phone to another device, but it's something that allows you, that gives you a backup form of communication that's actually, that's, um, I want to be able to pre-establish all the components of it before I have to use it in a, in a, in a, in a bad world scenario. And one thing that I think gun culture tends to do is it tends to get the cart before the horse when it comes to the justification of certain things and so we it, we we think of we, we the easiest example of this is is you think of a gun that you want and then you think of a scenario to justify it you know like oh well i want and i want this one because i it, this could happen and 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 the issue we find that we find that issue kind of to be insufficient as far as motivation for a the acquisition of something it, it's, it's kind of in poor taste to buy a gun for a scenario as your justification even though everyone kind of even though it's rather obvious that you just you just want the thing and so when it comes to radios <clears throat> i don't i think the the challenge that most people are, most of us encounter when it comes to radios is is what for what am I using this for? And if you're in a scenario, if you're in a situation where you very obviously need something of this device, a, a communication tool of this sort, um, you're not really trying to figure out what I'm using it for. You're trying to figure out which one, what tool will solve the problem the best. And I think what we're looking at in our day and age is that we're very, very realistically considering what a decentralized communication network might look like. Because the problem that we're having with the centralized communications, whether it's phone, internet, you have what have you, is that that is that not only are they being controlled, but they're being controlled against a lot of our goodwill. And so now I think we're looking at legitimate ways of communicating. But then the other issue that we're running into is, and this goes back into the direction finding thing, is is as software technology and i think and this was brought up in the show with mojave repeater um as technology continues to grow we may a useful piece of information if we're facing an adversary is what they're what they're using and how they're using it and if i have that information i can track them and and, and make decisions appropriately and the i love that, that i loved when he was talking about the antifa guys getting the uh you know the walmart radios on frs channels that was funny i love that but that's exactly how it's going to work like right Right, and and in, in, in Antifa is just an example. I'm uh, and now I'm thinking sure. about, you know, like uh, what I want to do is I want to be able to learn more about and be more capable of the environments that I'm living in, and right. the the environments that we're living in right now are, so and this is what kind of led us here too. Again, is that I I've, I've noticed that there's a lot of talk about cybersecurity for the level of the individual. But the answer is sort of like, we'll get a VPN and be quiet about it. And that's, it's not really enough. I want to figure, I, I don't think that's, the more we learn about it, the more issues that we have. And so I want to be able to figure out the tail numbers is a really good example. If I'm going to go out into the, into bureau land, you know, I might, I might want to know what's flying above me. Right. So with this, with, with your, this ruggedized microcomputer, I can go out, out. I can literally go out into the wilderness, turn it on, and see what's what's flying around me. Is this? Yeah, and 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 many people do and have and send me videos all the time of it. The other guy, the guy the other day, is a construction worker, put an antenna on top of his car and just let it sit in his car and scan, 
would come to his car often to just check and see what was over him. You know, you talked about like, what would I need it for? Like that, that's the idea. It's like, okay, radios, but what do I need it for? Well, well here's was, a really easy example. Rittenhouse. Yeah. Yeah. Great example. Yeah. But, but even be, beyond the, you don't, I don't think you have to answer the question of what do I need it for to begin understanding that you do need it. You know, it's, it's just the thing of like observing you're only as your margin for safety, let's say like when driving a motorcycle or whatever is only as good as what you can observe. So if you can't see over the crest of a hill, then that's where your margin of safety ends. And that's very true. Like in anything that you're doing guns or otherwise, it's like, what can you see? Because you got to see the, the thing in front of you to be able to collect the data, to be able to make a decision and make a determination on what it is that you're seeing. And all that we're doing here with radio is just opening up a world where we can see the infrared spectrum. We can see the radio waves and we can see what they're doing with individuals, whether it's Rittenhouse or Antifa with walkie talkies or whatever, anything that's happening, anything at all that's happening, drone operations, uh, 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 you know, just so many things like some, a, a team of people using radios or uh, a, a door opening, you know, a, a door opening on a, on a giant hangar, you know, somewhere else that's using radio frequency to communicate that door opening. I mean, you just go off into the list of like all the different radio frequencies that are abound and everything that they're used for that we're not seeing. And all this is, is, is it's just another layer allowing you to observe the world around you and then, um, you know, make a decision and make a determination upon that thing that you're observing. So how is it, how is it, are you, are you familiar with the flipper? You know, your little... uh, yeah, so I brought it because I wanted to talk about it because before I got into this tech world, I think uh, Isaac had posted one of these and I had no idea what it was. And when Isaac posted one of these, I was like, I got to check that out. And this project, I had no idea when I got it, what I needed it for. This is an incredible example right in line with what we're talking about. Did not know anything about tech, did not know anything about pen testing, did not know anything about 120 you know, gigahertz RFID or like kilohertz RFID. Didn't know anything about all of that. Um, or de -authing. I got the Wi-Fi dev board as well. Like all completely foreign to me. And I bought it because I was like, that looks really cool. I went to their website. I started looking at what it was. And I think they oversold what it did, but it got the message across because ultimately it's a very simple product and it requires your creativity and your participation for it to become useful in your life. And, uh, I had, didn't have it in my hands, so I couldn't make that determination at the moment, but I knew I wanted it in my hands. Bought it in like November, got it in March, love it. Use it all the time for all sorts of different things, whether it's U2F authentication on my accounts or whether it's uh, just de-authing my own Wi-Fi to shut down my own cameras because you can do that and thinking about, wow, that puts me in a really vulnerable position where someone could just de-auth my Wi-Fi and shut down all my cameras at my house uh, or getting access into my door at my home that uses RFID, like all of these different things came about. And I think the flipper really kind of gave me the tech legs, if you want to call it that, for me to even think that I could attempt the grid-based project because it was really back-to-back. -back. It was it was flipper and then it was grid-based for me. So it's just interesting that you brought it up, but yes, very familiar with flipper. Yeah, so I, I picked one up too for similar reasons. It's kind of like the Suron, the flipper, and maybe now the uh, the grid base are all items that, to a ex greater extent, lots of gun culture is trying to invest into. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's I I can sometimes think about like how would I describe a device like this? Well, that was a digital lock pick. Like it'll it's not really a lock pick, but it's a digital tool that allows me to, as you say, take advantage of certain systems. Um, you're just, some, you're, now you're allowed to interface with the electronic world. It seemed like it was demons and dragons inside of a tube or something, you know, and you yep. start demystifying it and you're like, oh, I can play with these things. These yep. are tools the same way that a wrench is a tool. I just need to understand the language that that's communicating so I can communicate with it and a device to act as a go between. All right. So let's go back to the grid base and let's start with describe, describe what it is physically first, just to go through like a physical yeah. description and then let's go totally. back into some of the things that I want that I want to see what it does. Yeah. So we can do better than a, than a physical description. So it's a raspberry Pi four, uh, inside of a Pelican case, uh, you know, formerly a Pelican case. We've got our own cases that are being made now, but it's, it's just a seven inch touchscreen with a uh, Bluetooth keyboard that has a removable spot underneath 
for your Flipper Zero or anything else that you might want to keep within it. It operates on uh, Linux Raspbian, uh, but it's Linux based, it's open source, so you could make it operate on, on whatever you want it to operate on. It's fully waterproofed and sealed uh, around it, and it can be operated remotely over VNC. And so you could take it and put it away somewhere and get on a peripheral such as your phone or your laptop and communicate with it wirelessly using an internal modem. Um, so that's, that's the short of what it is as far as the technical aspect. It's a Raspberry Pi in a box. But if we dive into a little bit more of, of, the, of the usability in it, when we say internet in a box, um, I'd love to talk about the repository for a little bit if, if you have the desire. Are you talking about like you're talking about having your your uh, library of Alexandria available on there? Yeah, precisely. Go ahead. Yeah, so kind of going back a little bit to the conversation we were having about you know information being decentralized and like having access to your own information that's that's not being censored by someone else. Um, there's a real need for that. There's a there's absolutely a need for that in this day and age. Whether it's due to infrastructure collapses or intentional. Uh, attacks on information that exists. And so Gridbase uses a localized server and a localized hard drive to be able to access and stream that server of information um, to any device that's around you or to the device itself. So we're able now with, you know, Kiwix, again, we talked about technologies and software that came long before Gridbase was ever here. Kiwix is one of those uh, major players in this in this field. And if I'm not mistaken, was originally designed for teachers in austere locations to be able to have access to some of this stuff. And they, I don't know if they invented it, but they certainly pioneer, pioneered and brought awareness to Zim compression, um, meaning that you can compress an entire website into a Zim file. And as an example, you know, Wikipedia is just shy of 100 gigs, you know, and Zim compression basically puts whole bunch of uh, zip folders together and then when you click on things it's opening up a zip folder and closing it opening up another zip folder and closing it and so this technology had been around uh, for a long time and people had been using it on raspberry pis in schools in other places um, but the effort here was to put it in a ruggedized platform that could be taken anywhere and instead of just using Kiwix serve which is the, the the program that allows you to project your own internet into your own ip address there was a desire to be able to project that onto an internalized Wi-Fi router so that that information could then be spread again and anyone else could hop onto it. Um, so it's, it's old technology in the sense that localized servers were what the internet was in its infancy, was people connecting LAN cables to one another and accessing each other's servers. Um, and now that all that information is owned and held by a private server company that's got a connex that's waterproofed and, and underwater somewhere and so that's where you're going to access the information but we have the ability now to compress our own websites um, and get into some of these repositories and make our own internet uh, if you want to call it that which i think you should call it that because it is very expansive you know there's other players that have been a part of this like project gutenberg they took advantage of zim compression and what kiwix was doing and scanned over 10,000 books into a library called Project Gutenberg. And so Project Gutenberg has everything from literary classics to science books, and it's all searchable. So you can search these terms, you can search these books, you can follow the hyperlinks. One of the things that I appreciate about Project Guten Gutenberg specifically is that because they scanned all these old books, you're getting the real title of Huckleberry Finn, which seems like something that's innocuous, like I just want to read Huckleberry Finn, but I feel like when you're thinking about these hypothetical scenarios where somebody may not know what Huckleberry Finn looked like. Um, it's important to have these physical manifestations of, of these books. And so uh, project, I, sorry, go I ahead. Can give you, I can give you two examples right there that are, that, yeah. are, that are absolutely perfect. One of them is this. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of, in our house, we have a couple of old editions of encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. And they're older, you know, like they're, they're some, one of them is like closer to the turn of the century and not this century, but the one before. So like 1800s. Yeah. And the way that definitions have changed sometimes mm. comes about innocuously. Whoops. And then sometimes it's very, very not. Uh, it's, right. it's, it's very obviously done with a sort of malicious intent attached to it. Yeah, of course. So the issue, you know, the issue that this is where we fall into the issue of, of philosophy and metaphysics in this regard is that the, the definition of things matter. And now people say that all the time. We say that in politics all the time. Words have meaning and so on and so forth. But, you know, this how we think about the world does have some 
impact. And an advantage that someone would have, and one of the challenges that we have, is that the way that the information is provided about the past is very muddy. So much so that people believe phrases like, history is written by the victor, to be some sort of authoritarian, sta authoritative statement about what is true. And all that, all that a phrase like that actually means is that the likelihood that you're reading something, or, or, or if you're reading information on history, the likelihood you're more likely to be reading from the perspective of someone who say won. But that also breaks down the world into winners and losers, and, and that's just not, not really how it works. It's not just oppressors and oppressed. It's kind of a Marxist right. way of looking at information. And another, so the other example of what this looks like is if you take the Greek New Testament, how there are more copies of the Greek New Testament written in its original language than there is any other historical book. But that kind of information, for some reason, is made difficult or has been difficult for people to acquire. And some of it's just because they don't want to. I mean, fine, so be it. But the the world has been changed over and over and over again by information that's available. And we kind of know this inherently. And I, I think the idea that and what I'm saying as far as like uh, uh, having a, as you say, a repository of information recognizes that we are seeing people in our day and age try to change the society around them by changing what's available and being able to hold on and, and like the holding of certain information is becoming kind of, let's just say Fahrenheit 451. So go ahead. What so you've got yeah, the idea of the Gutenberg program or the, the Gutenberg? Right, so so Gut Gutenberg got a hold of it, but also Khan Academy got a hold of it, and this speaks more to the community rehabilitation aspect uh, of of the device. Is that uh, you know beyond surveillance and counter surveillance and, and all of those things that are very critical and very important, you also have to look at if there's no infrastructure around, and and we're missing some of these things. There needs to be an effort to maintain um, you know normal life. Um, you know, Osho said, what is, what is civilization but a clearing in the forest, you know? And so this is a bit of an attempt to maintain civilization uh, when the forest is trying to creep back in. And not for the sake of like holding on to what, what once was, but for the sake of maintaining community and providing a true north compass whenever things are seeming kind of chaotic and, and you're not sure what that true north should be. And one of the things that I believe that true north should be is the education of children and the participation uh, within a community to learn and continue on that path um, towards you know daily regiment and focusing on our own independent growth and not perhaps the chaos um, of what's surrounding us and you know what i was mentioning that khan academy had gotten a hold of it so in one of these repositories is um, you know k through 12 education programs and science programs from everything ranging on chemistry botany uh, all of those different types of scientific subjects and so being able to like you said, there's, there's these um, information that's being changed and science is being changed and, you know, some of these different things. It's like Khan Academy got a hold of this, zimmed up a file and was able to put it within this uh, uh, repository to make it, you know, servable to a larger group of people. And I think with, you know, the books, obviously what we talked about, Khan Academy within and of itself, medical repositories that are within there, um, army pubs and FEMA documentation on how to purify water. You know, a lot of these different repositories that are in there are based around it's basic community stuff, you know, food and water, healthcare, and education and, uh, and entertainment, you know, with, with some of the music and like jazz lectures and, and energy creation and vehicle maintenance and, you know, all of those different subjects that are within the repository. It's based on the continuation of a normal life where, um, where there shouldn't be one, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's what it sounds like to me too is, is, it's not so much that in the effect that the internet goes down. Let's just say that's not a problem. But we're finding out we're we're running into some issues, and this is this would be a, a scenario that I've seen as something like this would be useful. Is that in the we live in the post information age. We live in the information. The value of information has been inflated, or the or or whatever you want to however you phrase it, to the fact that it's I don't need to know anything anymore. I could just Google it. Now you can make criticisms about what people can retain and and what 
what our priorities are as far as information goes. But there is a certain amount of hubris required to believe that you can retain all of this information ad infinitum. Um, and so while we may talk about like hypothetical scenarios where let's just say you have like a, um, I was just in New Orleans, Nolens, uh, and you had another giant hurricane problem, another Katrina. Sure, it'd be nice to be able to crack open a box and be able to answer some questions that I'm looking for. What is the what is the chemical compound of such and such? What is the uh, what are the what are the side effects of this drug? What do I need to cure? Uh, to, so let's see, what can I use to um, alleviate this kind of infection? What can I use to create this kind of material? And that if that having access to that information doesn't make it void, it doesn't void out the requirement of being able to do it. But I think. That's only one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is what happens when you want to Google something, but you don't want to leave an, you don't want to leave a uh, a, yeah. a, a signature. Well, in a in a third, in additional to that, I mean, I'm homeschooled, so I very much identify with uh, the homeschooling community and the, and the mission of that. And so, without these extremes, you know, hurricanes or whatever, I mean, today there are children who are being homeschooled whose parents want them to do a research project. And, you know, maybe their resources are limited or maybe their resources are um, not varied enough. You know, sometimes homeschooling groups narrow in on just like one particular program or whatever. Um, you, you, your child could do a research project in a contained environment where it's not subject to the evils of the Internet, predators and all this other chaos. I mean, your child could affectionately be able to research and understand and learn about the world around it without having to confine it to this particular subset of curriculums, you know, and it's, I know that's something that most homeschool families are very conscious of is just like keeping kids off the internet and keeping them engaged in the curriculum and keeping them engaged in, in these very specific information, uh, you know, areas. But a lot of that is not because they're trying, well, I don't know, at least in my case, it wasn't because somebody was trying to limit what I was be, you know, being able to consume. It was more because there was a concern about what was going to be able to influence me on the other side of the thing that had more information on it. And so like we've talked about hurricanes or like, you know, these infrastructure collapses, but I think it has use even, you know, in the homeschooling sector today where you have control over information. And then also like there's so many people now that are, you know, have off grid cabins or up in other areas and spend time, you know, off the grid. And this can be a resource for them too in, in that time where it's not chaotic. It's not a, uh, it's nothing going on. It's too crazy. They just prefer a lifestyle that puts them outside of the reach of infrastructure. And I think there's still a need for that person there too, to be able to access some of the things that we've talked about. Yeah. The, yeah I can think of even some basic examples like people who live up in Alaska, there's always an option there yeah. or uh, right. just a lot of global travel. Mm -hmm. So now does the, um, How how about uh, location services? Does the do you, have have yeah. you have have you built it to have any sort of how, have you built it to have any sort of um, location capabilities? Yeah, totally. So uh, talk about two different location things. So one, we'll talk about like the SDR. We talk about QGIS. So again, this is not things that I developed. This is technology that's you know been on a backpack of something else for a very long time. It's just being compiled now concisely. Uh, but QGIS is a resource that's been in development for a long time. It's a companion for SDR that allows you to visually see where aircraft are on an actual physical map and allows you to see where satellites are in relation to the globe so that you can track them better um, and anticipate when certain satellites might be coming over certain areas. So that's a map, and I wanted to discuss that. But I think more traditionally and what you were talking about is actually geolocating yourself and maps as we think about it on our phones since we keep coming back to the phones thing. Um, but uh, yes, there is a maps uh, functionality on it. And again, a company called Foxtrot GPS has been in development for a long time to create an off-grid internet map repository. And there's seven different map modes. So where before, if you were going to be in a particular area, you would need to go get one of those different types of maps, or you would need to have a subscription to OnX, or you would need to pre-download it on your phone, or you would need to have ATAC, or any one of these things. Um, you know, if you were going to go buy a map per se, you'd buy a topographical map of that particular area. Uh, and then you would familiarize yourself with that area and, you know, run your ops that way. 
Uh, with this seven different map modes, we have satellite that's accessible to us. We have topographical that's accessible to us, the open street map suite, and then Google points of interest. And um, that gives us a lot of flexibility. You know, with Google points of interest, that's the exact map that you're probably used to using on your phone where it shows you there's a donut shop over here and a Walmart around the corner or whatever. And then with topographical, uh, it's through OpenStreetMap. So if you're familiar with OpenStreetMaps, then you're already familiar with the map repositories that are uh, local, locally hosted on this device. So it's an OpenStreetMaps topographical. Um, and there is there is a way for you to geolocate yourself exactly just simply plugging in a GPS dongle. So once you plug in that GPS dongle, it's automatically tracking the satellites that are in the area. It usually takes a couple minutes. Um, but within that couple of minutes, you get a very, very accurate uh, location of where you are in relation to whichever map mode you're on and with good resolution I mean you can zoom in as far as you would on your on your iPhone um, or whatever phone you're, you're using I mean very good resolution you can see the tops of buildings and I've done uh, videos on that before but yeah there is a maps and whether you need to geolocate yourself specifically or not there's a few reasons why I didn't include that inside the box but the main one is is so that if you don't want to be putting out a signature you don't have to be because you know inherently anything is uh, going to be putting out a signature, but with the Raspberry Pi, you have the freedom to turn off the Wi-Fi and turn off the Bluetooth. And some of these ESP uh, chips, like ESP32 chips, are still going to be emanating something, but it's it's helping you reduce your signature a little bit more. So, um, but also uh, for the reason that you could use that with another device. So not keeping these things all together keeps you know keeping it open source and collaborative. It gives the end user a lot of room to grow and a lot of room to be flexible depending on what they're trying to do with it in that particular moment. But with the external dongle, you can plug it in, get your precise location, and then use it to orient yourself on any one of those seven maps uh, to figure out where you are and where you're trying to go. So it's 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 a, it's a it's a doable thing. It's just not made for it out of the box. No, it is. It comes with the GPS dongle itself, and it's oh. it's made for it out of the box. Like if you purchased it today, it would come with the GPS dongle. And if you wanted to geolocate yourself, you would open up the maps, plug in the GPS dongle. When you plug Perfect. it in, a screen comes up that tells you how many satellites you're affixed to. And so once you get you know three to six satellites or whatever, then it'll give you an icon that says GPS fix. And once it says GPS fix, you know you're good. You can come back. And another thing that GPS uh, having a GPS signal allows you to do is it integrates with the entire Raspberry Pi. So on the home screen, there's uh, hams use a, a location metric known as uh, grid square. And grid square is a way within the ham radio world uh, to be able to identify your exact location. And so when you plug in the GPS, like I said, it spreads, throughout, spreads that information throughout the Pi and it populates it in different areas. So while it does give you your exact location on a map, it's also going to, on your HUD, if you want to call it that, give you your grid square information. And it'll also go ahead and start to sync all of the different times with your local time zone and Zulu time. Because the Raspberry Pi doesn't have an internal clock, which I find to be a good thing, uh, because you're able to get a very, very accurate clock no matter where you are. Um, so yeah, so it's it's ready to do all of that just by simply opening up, opening an app, and plugging in a GPS dongle, and, and then just waiting to get a GPS fix. Awesome. So we we've already covered three different things that it do that it that it do. We've already covered three, if not four. One of them is that we've you've been talking about um, just the basic of an SDR, and this is still yeah. something that like the the. the this is where I think this is kind of where I think we stand as far as on the individual level in in so much of the citizenry, especially gun culture, is that we're just starting we're, we're starting to dig very, very deeply into things like. This that that can be applied to multiple things and, and a really good example of it is um, overlanding and gun culture overlap a lot. They uh, overlap can quite I a bit. Can I give you an example real quick? I forgot to mention it earlier. Oh, uh, sure, sure. we're talking about people in gun culture, like diving into SDR and stuff. And we were also talking earlier about like, what do I need it for? And then we were talking about how Flipper, you know, you kind of get it and you don't know what you need it for until after you have it. And so one of my customers was experiencing this kind of symptom with the device. And so he just started playing around on SDR. And what he come to find out was that the school system was using unencrypted regular FRS channels to communicate where the kids were, when they were dropped off, whether or not they were dropped off with anyone or whether or not the parents were home. They were communicating all this information back to the school and, and amongst other school bus drivers to keep track of the route and where everyone was. 
doesn't take much imagination to think about like how that particular vulnerability could be exploited. But with that information, they were then able to go to the school board and, and push to get better, um, you know, more encrypted communication, which can still be cracked into. Um, but just to try and get a little bit more secure comms going on uh, or, or at least be more mindful of the information that was being spread over those unsecured comms. But an just another example of the of the SDR uses. Yeah, so I think it's it's a perfect example, though. Uh, the, it's a perfect example of one of the things that we're looking at right now. Let's go. Let's take a step back for a minute and go down. Go look at. Let's just take a step back, right, nice. and then look at yeah. all this this the, that we're that we have going on. Once again, yeah. we're sitting in the hotbed of a conversation in American politics and culture about whether or not people should be allowed to own guns and the safety of children and so forth in schools. And the the strange thing about the conversation that keeps coming up is that there's there seems to be this idea of like thoughts and prayers that seems to be argued about, but it doesn't matter where people are arguing about. They're basically just arguing over what the government should or shouldn't do. Should the government arm school arm teachers? Should the government be allowed to arm teachers? Should teachers be allowed to be governed, or, or should the teachers be allowed to be armed? Should we ban this gun? Ban that gun? Ban the sale? Ban the whatever? Right? And it's always like this weird. The thing that I'm talking about, and perhaps this is what it is in politics, is that the, the solution is, is always given from like a political angle. And well, maybe of course, the, yeah. The solution can't just be to have fathers at home. Yeah, right. Well, or even that of like, <laughs> I'm not even talking because because let me be very clear. I don't think there's going to be a day where somebody who has committed their life to the act, the activism of gun control, that's going to have. I don't think there's there's going to be a day where they change. They're convinced by a strong argument. I think that they're going to have to sort of yield to truth and recognize that they're wrong. I don't. I think uh, there's certain uh, there's a certain mm. level of it. But the other Certainly issue happened that happened in my case. Well, and I think the yeah. So like, I, there are arguments that are effective for making the conversation move around. And and let's like case in point example that we're looking at right now is that ten years. Well, not ten years. You see, what year is it now? It's two twenty twenty three. We're almost. We're like we're talking about ten years ago. There was Sandy Hook. Right. And a whole bunch of these conversations, a whole bunch of these talking points were trotted out in front of the world. And all of them turned out to be wrong. Like, you know, the ghost guns, machine gun things, and all these different descriptions on, you know, the 50 cat the, or the 556 five, eviscerates human tissue and turns it into powdery mist and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, all of this stuff was disproved, right? And And then, sure enough, we have an event that goes on seven years later, and the same people come up with the same statements that they said before. So there's a there's an argument saying like it's it's a disingenuous argument. Well, it's and, because it's because the ultimate core of the mission hasn't changed, which is keep 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 the psyop going, keep fear instilled. And you know, as long as you are participating in the psyop, you are going to feel that fear because it's by design that you are being made to feel fear feel, feel fearful of something. And I'm not in here saying that Sandy Hook or any school shooting is like a government you know, perpetrated event. Like, I don't think that that really matters. What matters is that whether it happened organically or whether it happened inorganically to stay in touch with the fact that it's being used to manipulate your relationships with the things you have around the world and to pull yourself out of that and, and keep yourself clear from the psyop uh, so that you're not feeling fearful about any of that. Like, you yes. know, they spend all, they spend all their time keeping you in fear. Because if they spend all their time keeping you in fear, then they can be made to look like uh, they're the ones that kept you safe. You know? And until we start bringing the authority of our own safety back into our own home and into our own hands, we will always miss the point, whether it's school shootings this time or Chinese spy balloons another time or whatever it is. You know? Yes. Okay. So this is where I'm going with this one. Is it's the, the, the issue that I, I'm, notifying, I'm noticing is that it doesn't matter whether you're pro- you're, you're, you're for having oh, the individual right to own a gun or you're against it. Everyone's providing government solutions. And maybe the answer is you go solve it yourself. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like yeah. it's, it's your school. Yes. Maybe, maybe it's you, maybe that's where we like, we look at it. And the, another example would be, um, you know, your, your churches, right? Like if you're in right. leadership at a church, are you considering the security and safety of your, of your, flock so to speak right. i think the answer is you kind of have to and i was going to put this into an ind individual podcast on my own line but maybe we'll dive into it a little bit right now is that there's this there's this phrase that i've seen pop up before and 
and and we've we've all heard it before too but it goes something like this all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing mm. and some people say that it's attributed to winston churchill but i think it's more classically attributed to uh john stuart mill john stuart mill wrote on liberty and the our issue that i have with the argument is if you are if you do nothing how are you how is it if a good man does nothing how can he be considered good <laughs> right right and so like we have this issue in our world that we're looking at is that we're constantly i'm constantly hearing this conversation about you know the world's falling apart or the or the country's going to hell and the sort of secondhand fear mongering and, and maybe the answer is whose permission are you waiting to go solve your problems because yeah. they're the 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 issue there's a reason why it never changes. There's a yeah. there's an issue why there's there's this this never ending cycle. Like, do you really want the government solution to school shootings? That's making you a slave, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so well, maybe well, maybe we people, don't. It's it's not entirely their fault. I mean, the school system. I mean, they they certainly accountability needs to happen, right? I'm not saying it's not their fault, so that they're not held accountable for that line of thinking. But I also think that it's systematic. You get people in schools who are, uh, you know, brought up, uh, and now you've got mom and dad out of the house working. So the school's going to raise you, and the school's going to teach you everything. And it's like, of course, they're looking for government solutions to these issues because all they've been given since they were in kindergarten was a government issue to education. And so, of course, they don't know how to do these certain things, or they don't know how to think this certain way. And it's because it was the government who told them how to think and what to learn. And so then they grow up almost with an inability to, to even be able to critically think about anything because they're so, uh, you know, institutionalized into thinking the way that, that the government wants them to think. I don't think it's some big giant plot. I don't, I mean, Neither there's, do certainly I. Some, there's certainly some tendrils in it, right? I'm not saying it's this big giant thing. What I think is it's just like, the natural progression of things when you have a lot of people in a certain area and then you put people are just going to be people. You put people in charge, they're going to make decisions and those decisions are going to be in the interest of some people and not in the interest of others. And I mean, it's just the way that it goes, you know, and Very much I think so. as, as soon as we pull out of that, pull out of that and start diagnosing for yourself, um, you know, what your role is within it or, or maybe not even that, live in touch with the people around you. You know, I, I work um, in a very varied environment with all different types of people. And I can almost guarantee you that I'm not going to get along with every single one of them on an intimate level. But I'm kind to all of them. And they're all kind to me. And we all see eye to eye in the fact that we're there to feed our families and we're doing the best that we absolutely can. Is my version of a best their version of best? No, but that's okay, because we identify on the same level of caring for the people within our community. And so, yeah, just, I don't know. I remember where we tore off at, but it was something that was basically just like, you know, the way that people think and identify themselves with, you know, the, the current state of affairs, you know, and I think it's more about detaching yourself from the current state of affairs because fear has always been instilled fear by people in power has always and will always be instilled. So, the, the closer you can get to not being a slave and not being ruled by that is to zoom all the way out and put the lens cap on it and dive right into your life. And it's not about being an ostrich with your, with your head in the sand. It's about not allowing that fear to control you and not allowing that fear to make your decisions about how you feel about people and the, and, and the things around you, you know. And I think, too, there's this other thing where we feel very committed to an identity and I want to say very plainly that there's no obligation to be who you were five minutes ago. Um, nobody expects that of you. And so there's kind of this resistance to growth because it's like, well, the way things have been done and will be done. And, and we put that on our own selves. It's our own personal checkbox, you know, but we can absolutely zoom out of that and be done with that and just start tapping into what really matters and, and what we have control over you know, and not be focused on what's going on in the hellscape of Babylon that will continue to go on no matter what we do, right? So it's it's taking care of, of our own and, and being focused on that mission. Oh, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything other than amen, because that's a fantastic way of saying it. But I mean, look <laughs> at it this you. way, too. Look, yeah. I mean, look at it this way. Like, the, the, we have... We have we've had we have an, a a giant explosion of homeschooling, and I think there's a lot of criticism to be thrown at the education system, and I think that criticism continues to grow and grow and grow and grow. 
there we, we we've been talking about this a number of times in the recent past uh in the recent shows which would be we've been talking about the structure of scientific revolutions by thomas kuhn and he in, and this is where you get the idea of the paradigm shift and like yeah i don't need to go into to, to i don't need to go into it again for those who've been listening but the issue that we're running into is that you have all these criticisms that are leveled at our education system. Like, oh, it was designed to make people slaves. And oh, it was designed to make people factory workers. And oh, it was right. like, yeah, our, our current education system came about as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Right. Hey, and guess what? It was never by design. You were supposed to be raised in a totally different way. In Finland, they don't even put kids in school until they're seven years old. You know, so it's like, oh, well, it's by design that the school system sucks. Like, no, just the general concept, like what you're talking about, like the, it's a product of the, you know, the 30s and the industrialization period. It's like there's a that lot of good stuff that came out of that. But education should have been like about children and creativity and growth and all these things. Education didn't need to become a product of, of industrialization, in my, in my opinion, you know. Our, well, no, our education system was the product of the Industrial Revolution. Right. It does that. That is an that is an amoral, moral, abject, obs, like no moral argument. It's just it, it's what happened. We right. had our society, um, the human society, was changing from a mostly agrarian society to a right. industrialized society. And you cannot produce, you cannot, you know, like you cannot educate a population at its growth rate. Like people were. <laughs> the, Right, right. The, we were the, the population density and these other kind of all, all these other kind of issues. Now we've been able to very very keenly identify some of the very very negative things that have come out of that. We've been very we've been pretty keen on on identifying maybe maybe not we but quite a few people are starting to see holes in it. Take COVID yeah. for example. COVID the the whole the whole thing revealed to a lot of parents that the teachers who are teaching them are the last people who should be teaching anybody at all. You, were, you know the injection of ideal ideologies into our education system the separation of church and state in the form of the separation of taking the uh, church out of the schools is a like or sorry taking prayer and and, re, and re, even religion out of schools was a, a an attempt to create something or to change maybe what the definition or the purpose of the school was maybe it was more of a reflection of the population itself that we were becoming a less and less religious population. But the problem thing that we found out is that if you take, you cannot take religion out of education. You cannot take the things that de define that which is true out of education and still retain with education. Because we complained then immediately afterwards that like it's just creating automatons or whatever. And so, you know, it, when I, we're seeing in our day and age this massive resurgence, or maybe not resurgence because I was homeschooled as well, but we were the, in our gener in my age, being homeschooled was the odd thing, and now I can't imagine yeah, a future same. where you would want to be anything otherwise. Like right. the the world is trying. People that I know, the the people that we know in our world in our communities are are, are really kind of sorting in themselves into one of two groups. They're either actively trying to figure out how to raise their children better, or they're making their children wards of the state, and that's mm. it. Like. There's no, it is, it is a very harsh dichotomy. You, people are either choosing to raise their children or they're giving them up to the state effectively. Right. Yeah. And now there's a conflict over that. Now you could introduce Maoism and that fight that happened there. But I, continuing on back to even maybe having a repository of information in a device that is not required, dependent on the internet to function that suddenly sounds like a really good idea, right? Yeah. I have a library behind me, but that's a matchstick away from being nothing. Right. Well, and, and it's, and, um, you know, being mobile is important um, for all kinds of reasons. And so, you know, it's like, if you had to take three with you, I'm sure you would know which three you would take, but what a terrible decision to have to, to have to take on which knowledge grid you want to keep forever. <laughs> you know, it's heavy. Uh, yeah. So yeah, being able to take ten thousand plus with you, you know, it's it's, it's a major advantage. And 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 you know, I mean, we saw with like I think it was Hurricane Harvey, or like, or even recently with some of the tornadoes and stuff, like mandatory evacuation stuff. You know, it's like nothing's gonna. I have things that I'm gonna take, right? Like very important things to me. One or two items that are totems that I hold on to. Uh, everything else can burn, um, but you know, it's like 
if forced to move out of a certain area for any particular, or even like, dude, that train derailment, like displaced a lot of people. This is not like pie in the sky stuff anymore that like we're some doomsday preppers or whatever. We're actually just observing what's happening around us and making critical decisions about what we want to do about those things happening around us. And so, you know, it's, it's very normal, a very natural thing to, to do, to want to protect your um, information in your family. And, and a way of doing that is taking your own private repository. Yep. Okay. Uh, you know, and this is going to be an example of it too. So I've got these three books on my shelf right here, um, the Sanction series, by an author who his code name or his pseudonym was Roman McClay. And this is not an advocate for him and his writing because he turned out to, um, I think it was in the later months, the last months of 2021, uh, he he went he he got he got killed because he went on a murderous rampage. Uh, so the author, you know, so he, so, so the, but the, the point about it is a subject like that. Now I've only read one of the books and, and you know, like it, you get this issue, you get stuff like, um, Ted Kaczynski, you have these characters who write these, you know, criticisms, and maybe we should read some people's criticisms and try to understand maybe how we think like them and how we think differently from them. The certain problem that we might encounter with reading as well is that we only tend to read things within our echo chamber. Um, and reading is a good way to get get you out of that as quickly as possible. I, I, I resent that. I just finished the Twilight series. You resent that. You just resent. <laughs> you just finished the. You resent that you just finished the Twilight series. Okay. No, no. I re, no. I, the Twilight series is outside of my echo chamber. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> oh, that, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I am so sorry for your loss on that one. I have not. I. No, I dude, the it was one. Good. It was. It was a good creative journey. You know. Let me just kind of spread my mental wings a little bit. Yeah, I had, I had, I last year I, I went, I under underwent the uh, harrowing experience of reading left wing civil war ideology and literature. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, that was a fun time. I, I, yeah. I like, it was, it was not a fun time, but it was a fun time. It's interesting to see like how different cultures talk or different subcultures of America are even talking about this idea of civil war. And uh, let's just say it got a lot spicier than I expected. Oh no doubt. But that comes up from time to time. Uh, but the point of that one is that I don't think you can acquire his books anymore. Mm. So I'm, I, you know, as much as it is, I, I, I think I'm thankful that I have them because I can read this guy's argument, knowing now that part of that argument drove him to go do something that was probably assumed to be immoral. And I think, I, I, you know, it's pretty pretty easy to condemn it as immoral. He went on a rampage and tried to kill a bunch of yeah. people and then got shot in the process. Right. Um, but now it's that that's kind of the real world that we live in is that ideas have consequences. And so yeah. being a, I don't now that I, I'm glad that I, I was able to acquire all three of them before any of this event happened. But that is a thought of mine of like what happens when you, you can't find information anymore. Yeah, uh, because it's all behind a hidden behind a wall, and so being able to document inf information or keep a journal and keep information together, I've been journaling for fourteen years, and that's an important piece. Um, I want to. Uh, this is this, if I may just touch on the back end of that. Um, you know, we talk about about grid based being able to grow with your your needs. You know, so it, we've talked about some of the repositories that are already hosted on it, but let's say that you wanted to encapsulate. Um, you know, the, the information that you were just talking about, the author you were just talking about, uh, you can do that. And you can put that on there and you can share that information on your localized server. So I know we talked a little bit earlier about it can be a ready thing right now or it can go as deep as you want it to go due to the fact that it's open source and ready to go. Uh, but that's another example where you want to start creating your own repositories from the own things that you think are important. You want to start uploading those and sharing those with the other people who are active within the grid-based community or who are active on other communities that utilize this same type of structure and this, and um, play with the same idea. It's like there's a whole brand new community here. And it, my hope in the future is that we're ultimately able to host a very, very large grouping of uh, repositories that people could then independently put on their own device and, and tailor it to their needs or just drag and drop all of them if they have the space. But yeah, that's, that's where I see this technology and that's where I see this, uh, this use case kind of growing is somebody like you finding something like that important and there may be somebody else on the other end who would also love that and, and y'all being able to share that information and, and have it locally forever in your own private library of alexandria not to be taken away you know what uh what communications capabilities does this device have 
Yeah, so most simply, uh, it has a internal router with a VPN. Using that router, you can jump into different mesh networks. Um, now, mesh networks are something that some grid-based users are playing with, uh, as a lot of people are playing with, uh, namely uh, Austin Mesh, um, in communication with those guys, those guys to get some more testing done on the mesh network aspect. Um, when we talk about communication, I think we're I think we're talking about actually talking, which I'll get to that too. But I also wanted to just get onto the actual sharing of that information. If you were on a a, a mesh network, other people could access um, you know the repository. Um, but we using that same mesh network or using the internal localized router, you can pull up different chat windows. And anyone else who's also pulled up those chat windows, you can be able to send text messages back and forth um, with the internal router up to 300 feet, and then of course. Uh, essentially unlimited with like solar mesh networks, depending on how big the solar mesh network grid is. Um, but it uses VNC to do that, which VNC is actually intended uh, to be able to log into another computer from another computer, um, which this device has that capability. We talked about that earlier with being able to close it up and operate it from a distance. So if you had an antenna out in the rain and you've got a waterproof battery pack and you want to set it on top of a hill, you could monitor that waterfall for SDR, or monitor those different planes with ADSB, you know, on your phone from inside a shelter while the box is out there doing its thing. Um, but we can also use VNC for the chat reasons. So uh, VNC is a readily free available uh, application, uh, you know, software that you can put on your computer or download on an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy or any of those things. And uh, it gives you your own IP address. So as long as those two parties have that IP address, it's as simple as entering that IP address in and then going into chat. And it opens up a chat window that you and whoever else is on that VNC server in that chat room, it allows you to, to, to communicate back and forth via text. I wish I could. I, w I wish I was better at understanding that piece. You, I'll, I'll break it down. I'll break it down. Because I, because I think I because I think I get it, and, and this is where I'm running into a problem. Is the last thing I need to do is go. I got it, but then I don't. No, so, let's, let's, it's, it creates an opportunity for me to break it down further. So if you don't mind, I'll, I can. Please I do. can make it. Yeah, let's do that. So, screen sharing. Say right now you could have VNC on your phone and your laptop. You can pull up your phone and you can see your laptop. It's screen sharing. We do it every day with our phones and we stream something to our TV or we, you know, we stream something from our computer to something else. So all we're doing is, is screen sharing. And the only difference is that VNC is just a thing that we can integrate with a open source project and um, you know, projects that are already existing or our products that are already existing with iPhone and computer and these other things. We can just use VNC to be the link between all of those. You know, a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi router is the same everywhere, and all of our phones and devices are all able to connect to that. That's like a universal language that we've all agreed upon. Like, we're going to talk about things over this radio frequency length. It's just the same way if you turn it into 144.925 on your ham radio and somebody else is tuned into that frequency. We've all agreed that we're on that same page. So a Wi-Fi router uh, is on the same page with every other device that has Wi-Fi access. So... They're saying, yep, we're going to communicate on this same frequency. And then VNC is saying, yep, we're going to communicate using this IP address. And then that's allowing you to connect with any individual that's operating in that same sphere. So there's there's two concerns. There's two concerns when we're talking about communications in any way, shape, or form. And I'm and one of them is security. Um and 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 not it's not it's it's like security and, and basically reach. Let's think of it that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the one of the reasons why the UV five R is so I think one of the things that it that it, it has reached is that it's that that adds to its popularity. Is so many people have them. Mm -hmm. So when everyone has one, it it, it you know it, at a certain point in time, it sort of sells itself. Let's just kind of put it that way. Yeah. So you know, and then the the criticism against the UV five R is is a completely unsecured system, and then it breaks pretty easy, and it's not very weather uh, weather ruggedized, and there's all these other kind of issues. Ah, uh, yeah. But, you know, so be it, right? That's just kind of how yeah. it works. Well, that's, that's just, you know, people want to get snooty about things just for the sake of, its, if it, of it differentiates themselves. You know, it's like, it's not that they're wrong, um, but in a certain sense, they are. It's like, I can decrypt P25 encryption using SDR. You know, nothing's really encrypted. The government can listen to what we're saying right now, even if our phones are turned off through microchips. So there's kind of this false layer of understanding of what encryption is and like, how we interact with it. And there's a bunch of people that want to put down something 
for the sake of elevating something else because they have an interest in that thing. And it's like, it's all, it all exists on a very loose hierarchy. So is P25 encryption better in a certain sense? Yeah, it is. Um, is it accessible for most people? No. So does it need to be accessible for most people? Yes. But that doesn't make it to where a UV5R, in my opinion, is, is any less than, uh, you know, like an Anytone or a Hytera or any of these, like, you know, really incredible digital radios. It's about being able to meet someone where they're at within the hobby and with, within the tool itself. You know, if a guy went out and bought a high point and was like training the shit out of a high point, uh, you know, and just, and just became really proficient with it, it would be really ridiculous for us to come by and say like, you know, wow, it's not a, a CZ P10C. You know, it's like the guy's gotten really good with a high point and the tool is there. Uh, is it the most precise tool? No, but did he make it work for his ability and was it within his budget and his skill set and his knowledge base? Yes. So there's there's an effort by people out there to discredit the UV5R and I'm by no means sitting here propping it up. But um, but it it's a product that meets people where they're at and, that, and you can grow with that radio really well. You can access repeaters and you can do things with it. And although they're not weatherized, they are pretty rugged for the price. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just... I, th I don't think it's necessary all the time to have the best equipment or you can't play, I guess is more what I'm saying. You know? Yeah, it's like, I think, like, yeah, I think no, you can play and you can use coded language. Like if you're really operating within a community, you guys can come up with coded language that only you people know. So, that's, so then that, it's like, yeah. so then who, what does it matter if my radio is encrypted or not? Like nobody knows what Bangladesh two chocolates mean, but that's what we're talking about. And we all know what that means. And so, yeah, there's, you could get as, just because you have p25 encryption doesn't mean it can't be decrypted it's like nothing's unhackable nothing is beyond the scope if somebody wants the information they're gonna get it from you especially with like some of the stuff that's coming out of uh, tiny tx transmitters like they're making some really crazy stuff i don't know if you guys are familiar with them but you know they're making like audio listening devices that operate for like years on end on a single cell battery and uh, have 4g locating features and stuff and it's like dude Somebody could throw that in your pack or like sew it in. You wouldn't even know, you know, or just attach it to your vehicle. And it's like all this effort for all this radio stuff. It's like, wouldn't you rather have a directional antenna that would help you scan your vehicle to see if your vehicle's putting out any RF anywhere where it shouldn't be? And then give yourself the opportunity to address that, you know? Um, I don't know. There's a need for all of it. But I just have a little bit of a distaste for people who want to like, you know, put down something else. It's like, really, it's just... It requires more creativity to use it in an encrypted way. I yeah, don't I'm, re I'm reading a book on it on on encryption right now that was recommended by Peter Johnson of Archway Defense. So if you're listening, uh, first of all, holler out to you. But it is, I think it's called the Code Book, and there is a pretty clear distinction that's made rel relatively early in the book between de like cipher, like uh, having a um, like a ci uh, like enciphering something, right? And encoding it, or or one of one of the, another version of what it would be is like is, am I, because like think of a, a written message as a series of letters. Am I changing those letters with other symbols, or am I changing them to be something else with some method of turning them into what they're supposed to be? Right. Like um like we and we've been using some of that kind of stuff. Actually, we actually the reason why I'm reading the book and why I find it so interesting is because we're also using it in some of the stuff that we do for Redacted as a as a, as a company. Um, because it, it it just it is that interaction. We 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 got to learn how to talk to each other again in better ways. And so, but there's a difference between inci enciphering something and encrypting it or encoding it or or, or there's another word I'm looking for. But, but some of that is just the quite quite frankly yeah the use of code words and how we talk to each other and so this is all a good thing let me very be very clear all of this is a good thing even though we don't have very obvious answers and we're not completely yeah. certain um i think we have a lot to be thankful for in the sense Absolutely. of you know gun culture is trying to figure out how to become more independent how do we talk to each other? How do we figure out things that are more capable of communicating with less likelihood of in infiltration by uh, malicious actors? Just to put it gently. 
there's always going to be some issues, you know. So they ha- have perhaps the biggest joke is that we're talking about it on a show that's going online. <laughs> I right? always think that man is it's like you know the um, oh what do you military guys call it, dude? Y'all have some name Op- for opsec, it. dude. Opsec, yeah, yeah. It's like there's all these people that are talking about opsec, and then they're going online and like this is everything that I know and every gun that I have and every opinion that I have. Uh, you'll never see a gun in any of my videos or anything that I talk about because it's just not relevant. And the people who want to know what my opinion is on those things probably already know it if they're like really looking into it, you know. So I don't know. It's it's equal parts hilarious that we're talking about it, but also it's like it doesn't matter if we talked about it or not. Yeah, well, there there is a certain issue with that, and that is the we as we as I was talking about at the beginning, gun culture. The American people are very, very well equipped when it comes to the possession of firearms. But what we seem to be losing is the battleground of ideas. And we start hearing people talk about things like fifth generation warfare. And we start talking about these kind of things, these ideas of like insurgency and malinformation, misinformation, disinformation. And, And this goes back to my argument on. Uh, we live in the we live in the post information age where it's not the access to information that's the bottleneck. It's the uh, it's the evaluation of information which is creating the problem. And so the you know part of the issue that goes back to the issue of education is we complain about the education system being shit. Tough luck, dude. Figure it out is really the right. only thing that I can say. Is that like is that is that if you're dependent on a system that's failing you and that system is motivated to fail you and you've correctly identified that that system is failing you then why are you still are you still participating in it why are you yeah. still contributing to it as a whole and it's the same that I've used this example multiple times but it's the it's the father who goes to church every Sunday and sits in the ant room, anterior room or the entry room complaining about how the school is so bad while right. he sends his daughter to school he goes, oh, well, I don't have time. And then when right. she turns 18, he forks over his life savings so that she can go to go to college right. for who the hell knows what. And she yeah. ends up coming home, hating him after basic, giving away all of her, her, her virtue. Sure. And she hates him. It's like, dude, you failed because you right. complained about this problem from the beginning. Like, I understand it. And there's just been this topic that's on, that's been on the forefront of our, our conversation quite a bit lately. And that is just because you can identify that something is wrong doesn't mean that you're providing a solution. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's way more uh, time for people to talk about what's wrong than than a time for people to talk about solutions. A saying that I have in my marriage is we can make excuses or we can make time. And mostly I direct that at myself when, you know, balancing a business and a, and a job and a family and all those things, it's it's. It's not hard, but it's work no matter uh, who you are, you know, and I try and just direct that question to myself many times when can I do this? Can I do that? Am I making an excuse for why I can't or am I making time to be able to be a good husband and a father and run this business and go to work and be a member of my community and get involved in my chamber of commerce and all of those different things? It's like it's much harder to come up with solutions than it is to sit around and identify what the problem is. And oftentimes the solutions that people tend to come up with is, um, you know, I've got a hammer, everything's a nail type solutions and it's a shame. And it, yeah, yeah, just we've talked about that point multiple times here, but you're right, man. It's it's much easier to identify a problem th- than it is to fix it. But, you know, it's also that thing that we talked about a little bit ago where people have this identity amongst themselves and there's no obligation to be who you were five minutes ago. A lot of people don't feel that way. And so it's like they can recognize it's, it's sad. I feel for those people. I'm not mad at those people at all. I, my heart hurts for them because they've identified something, but they've structured their life in a way that just creates prisoners out of them. And no one taught them because they were institutionalized or they were not able to teach themselves that they don't have to be a prisoner of the world that they live in and that they can create a beautiful world around them and that they can instill virtue in the people around them and they can hold others accountable around them to make your pocket of the world to something that's worth living for and something that inspires other people. And, and, and you know, we, it, it ends up just being like, I'm the guy that listens to talk radio that complains about stuff. And like, that's his identifying marker. And that's how he fits in with the dudes at work. Or, I mean, and that, that goes for everybody. It's like, I'm the guy that does this and that's the suit that I wear, you know, as opposed to you just being a human experiencing things and talking about those experiences. We very quickly have this tendency to like strap labels on it and and, and put ourselves in. And it's, an, it's really just in an effort to feel safe because it can be dangerous to go out on a limb with some of these thoughts. And then certainly the actions that follow those thoughts. And, you know, we seek this safety in, in identity. 
Um, but I think it's a much safer world when we're able to, you know, proliferate our creativity and not be bound uh, and not be prisoner to um, the ideologies and, and the expectations that people have of who we once were. You know, it's, I lost all my friends when I transitioned from being, you know, a, a liberal uh, anti-gun person and I just full swing, dude, there was no in between for me. I full swung. It was like, poof, here we are. Lost all the friends from that department, you know, and it's like, whatever, good riddance, you know, made great new ones over here. And, but it can, but it, it's not that easy for everybody, you know, and especially if you grow up in certain scenarios that, you know, leave you with abandonment issues or whatever, it's like, now you're dealing with all these other layers of, of psyche on top of this, this thing. And it's not easy. I want to seek to be a voice to change that and encourage people to wise up and uh, don't be a prisoner of the world around you. That's what everybody wants of you is to be a prisoner of their thing and, and be creative and break the mold of, of where you're at and, and take that choice to do that different thing, no matter how small, um, because that's what's going to be required to have a world worth living and going forward. You know, it's, it's a miserable world otherwise when we're all institutionalized gray suits, you know. We're all miserable. <laughs> You know, I, I I wish I had I wish I had heard you say that two years ago. Sometimes yeah. there are other things, other ways we could say it. But yeah, I, I I wish I wish my younger self had heard somebody say that too, man. Yeah. Oh hell yeah! No, it's yeah. it's good because the world is it's, it's it is it is tough out there, right? I mean, there's yeah. you can, we can find a lot of things to complain about. Totally. And I, you know, and it's like there 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 are, there are so many analogies that go into this, but. One thing that I, the one thing that's become, I think, rather painfully obvious to the American people is that most of the people that are in charge are the last people you want in charge. Totally. Yeah. And and we can identify that pretty easily. Like the people who are teaching us are the worst, are the least capable at education. Sure. The, the people who, you know, we have all these challenges, and it's like, and it's easy to get extremely discouraged. Yeah. And just sort of quit. Can I jump in right here and just say I have a massive respect for teachers and educators. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're like yeah school's rough and like there's a lot of things that are wrong with it but i know a lot of good teachers out there too that like are really poor in their heart and soul and, and they're trying and whatever and they may be victims of a system but in anything we've said thus far like i support teachers you know and and i don't know how challenging that must be um uh, but i'm sorry carry on i'm divided in the idea of like i support teachers I'm very I don't support all teachers. That's for damn sure. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But, see, I, yeah. The, the, here's the thing. Yeah. Like, I, I I don't support teachers at all. I don't. I, it's it, sure. that's not a thing to support. It's it's that's an individual who's doing something good. If I can but, identify yeah. a person, then that that makes a point. Right. It's the same thing. But we see we see the same thing. The issue in the policing situation is like I don't support all cops. Of course. None of us do. I mean, maybe some yeah. of us do, but like, yeah. but they're but the the vast majority that I, I know have a Punisher of, skull on my truck. All right, I'll let you know. That's a joke. That, that is a tisk tisk. But don't have a Punisher skull. Do you have a Punisher skull with a thin blue line? Because that's uh, oh, the yeah, best of course, and the red, so that people know that I also support firefighters, dude. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I mean, you, you get... I mean, how else are they gonna know? You know, and they need to know. Yeah, the 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 only I mean, the only time that's gonna know is when you're not at, at, well, whatever. Probably being not being a dick to them, but <laughs> you know, we're we're neither here nor there. Um. But no, I, I, I don't. I, that's where I have an issue. It's like, what do you mean we support? Like, yeah, sure. The, the, the so there's a school in Austin called Apogee. If you're not yep, familiar with it, I'm you familiar. should definitely check it out. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's what I'm saying is that like there's certain people in this sphere who, you know, we talk about skill sets and desires and things like my desires to do this. There's some people that are educators that are in this department to carry the same philosophy. And they are starting and running successful schools like Apogee and many other Montessori schools and things throughout the throughout the uh, nation and, and yes. world, you know? So like when I say, I, I think I've made it very clear that I don't support the infrastructure. I don't support the indoctrination thing that it's become, but I do support people who have a passion and a heart and a desire to educate children and take care of that and, and who are passionate about that and who are doing that in the right way. I just don't want to lump teachers in that because that's a specific skill set that they have, that they've been given that satisfies them. And they have a platform to continue doing that. It just may not be in, um, you know, the the current messed up infrastructure. But I blame government all the way. You know, like yeah, like it's an interesting. Can, it, it's yeah, an but interesting I support thing for two educators. homeschoolers to be talking about public like, public education. I know, man. Well, you know, it's like it's like so many people in that are having these thoughts and stuff. It's weird because I probably like you felt really ostracized and 
out of pocket and autistic, you know, like growing up and, and not fitting into the mold because I was very public schooled. Um, but I find myself being much more aware, like I'm glad, like whatever it was that that happened and whoever it created me to be, like, thank God it did because like to be in the norm and to be swimming with that school of fish looks, looks really crazy and just, you know, I'm sure they're having a good time too, but I'm having a good time with the experience that I had with that. And I think it is interesting that we come across these, uh, we end up in these spheres and we're both homeschooled. And, and of course, there's many others throughout this same sphere of conversation that are also homeschooled. Um, but yeah, I think who else but us to sit and criticize the public school system because we have reaped the benefits of not being indoctrinated within it. So like, yeah, you know, of course, someone who is indoctrinated isn't going to stand outside of it and be like, um, not that there certainly hasn't been, because there are, but yeah, I think who who better but us to sit and look at it and be like, man, I'm glad that didn't happen to to me or us or whatever. I I mean, how it works is is you and I can both look out into the world or look into people that we've met in the past and be like, oh my goodness, the public school system ruined you. Yeah, it's very and much how I view <laughs> it. But it ruined that person as an individual. Sure. It's a little different than than saying like, you know, it ruins everybody. Sure, everyone and then yeah. may, people might think they're the exception, fine. Yeah. But the um there's even, definitely, even, definitely even issues, the, yeah. the, the like the package of like when you're graduating, like at least the way I've understood it is that like when you're 15 and 16 or whatever, the school is trying to get you to decide on a career. Decide on a career, pick it, go out, do it and be successful at that. You know, as opposed to just like the natural evolution of gaining experience and meeting people and going through life and developing a passion for a particular thing and then seeking that out and becoming a professional in that area. And, you know, it's like it's this very rigid, like you need to pick now, you need to go. And, you know, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And it puts people in like this paralyzation thing where they either hold themselves to that thing that they picked then and then are miserable because they didn't let life kind of happen. Um, they just stuck to that thing and they followed that structure or um, they didn't do that because they felt pressure from that. And now they never really like ended up where they were in intended to be. Like, I don't know that there's nothing scientific behind that, but it's just like a, an observation that I've made of people who end up in that industrialized system. It's like they feel all this pressure at a young age, to like make a decision. And then if they don't make a decision, then they're a failure um, or they do make the decision and they succeed, but it feels like failure, even though on the surface they should be happy about it or whatever, you know. Just a, you know, in 30 years, it's been a, a number of observations like that from someone outside the school system that I've just that I've noticed. The putting a placing a burden upon a child to have their entire life figured out is probably not a good idea. Yeah, no, not at all. Some people, for some people, it works really, really well, and that's for sure. sure. You know, some yeah. people know that they're. I'll take a, a good example of, you know, like a family member who all, for a long time was going to, they're going to become a nurse and they became mm -hmm. a nurse and they were very successful at it. So, uh, well, you but, know, in, a, in an occupation like that, yeah, I guess it does require that. You're sure, sure. Yeah. But, the, but see, those are like, what I'm saying in that one is that, that that's an example of how it might work. And maybe we have to run into the problem of like an evaluate, in an evaluative structure, uh, the quality of an education system, if that's what we're going to call it, can so, in some ways be measured by how many people leave that into going into something in life that is valuable and participate that, that's fulfilling in some sense, and then how many people don't. Right. It's a really weird way of saying it, but I, I, there are some issues with it, and I think our generation was the generation that was sort of raised on "do what you love." Mm. Because I think you and I are both about the same age, and and a lot we were a lot of us were raised on this idea of like doing what you love, and that isn't always good advice. Yeah, yeah, it ruins the thing you love, <laughs> or it um, places the feeling of enjoying what you're doing as the ultimate value in what oh, yeah, you're yeah. doing. Right. Not not discipline, grind through it because it sucks. <laughs> not right. the, your your goal is to yeah. feel good about right. what you're doing instead of doing it excellently. Yeah. I, I, I find I have this issue myself. But it's interesting to see how that goes. It's like maybe the goal isn't to love what you're doing. Maybe the goal is to choose is to pick something that you want to do and do it excellently. Absolutely. And yeah. and the burden is actually the choosing part. 
Yes. And then the you know because a man with a Y will endure anyhow, but that I think that's a really big challenge, and I think we're actually seeing it. Like this is why I'm really encouraged, and this is why I go back to I the the thing about gun culture is that yeah we have the guns, we need the ideas. Yep. You know, it's, it's I don't need to ask for permission to go and figure out how that I'm how I'm going to make my community safer. Right. And I think one of the things that you're you're one of the things that you and I are still talking about, and I know it, it kind of it can sound like it's it can sound a little forced. Is that I I'm actively looking for better ways to integrate and communicate with more people. And this is an example of one of them is, is, you know, like I want to, I w in this dream world of mine, this sort of aesthetic dream world, it would be ideal to have some sort of tool that I can communicate with more people, but I have a, a special connected way of doing it. Like some sort of method we can communicate through a tool that's not, beholden to um beholden to say verizon yeah it's probably a good example of it right so like mesh networks are an interesting thing i think uh can you could you explain what a mesh network is i know what it is but totally. i would like a good explanation of it and then maybe how you would recommend it being implemented yeah that's awesome. I'd love to. Uh, so first of all, I am not the foremost authority on mesh networks. Uh, I would push you guys to Austin Mesh if you're looking for a page to talk more about that. There's you can just research some mesh networks, but I certainly can give you the clip notes version of, of what it is, how it works and where it came from and where we're going with it. So um, about the first time that I heard about it was whenever during the riots, I don't remember where, cause there were so many of them and I try to forget 2020, but during those riots, there was a, uh, like a, a, signal outage they like shutting down like cell phone signals and that was the first time i remember hearing about people who were setting up mesh networks to communicate and so i'm sure that was in development for a lot longer than that but that was like the first use case where i was like oh, okay cool that's very interesting a mesh network is a relayer uh, a copier a repeater it's just it's just transmitting something to something else um but it's it typically like in ham radio when you have a repeater you have to get FAA approval and you have to let them know where that repeater is and you know get space on a tower and all these different things and there's all these rules that the FAA has about repeaters like they have to be monitored and whole litany of um, what is it CFRs Code of Federal Regulations whole litany of CFRs for for operating a repeater um, mesh kind of answers that. Uh, repeater thing in a little different way that doesn't have those same limitations uh, with the did I say the FAA I meant the FCC anyway doesn't have those same limitations with the FCC guidelines and so what it allows you to do is because it draws a very low power to repeat that signal it can be ran on a solar panel a very small solar panel and and cell and then you can take these things people were putting them like you wouldn't even notice they were there because of these very small boxes most of the time but People would go and put them on like traffic lights, you know, climb up and then like put it somewhere where, where it looked like it belonged in a traffic light or near a stop sign or back behind a billboard or whatever. And um, it's open source, so you can make hardware and make different peripherals for it. Um, or you could use your traditional cell phone to log into that and send a message using that mesh network, that repeater, as the cell phone tower. So it's just a decentralized cell phone tower that you have to put up bit by bit. Um, that's probably the easiest way of explaining it because people are familiar with cell phone towers. Make a phone call, bing, 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 and then it goes all the way to wherever you're calling. This is that same idea, just in a locally hosted, open source, solar powered platform that requires the uh, programming and the effort to build it from you um, to then go and stash it around your city. And I love Austin Mesh because um, uh, they're just doing such a good job of, of making mesh networks uh, in and around Austin. And they're always very active with saying, hey, I, I sent a signal and received a signal from these two locations. Um, there's another group that I was working with that were in some national forest up in Washington. Wish I could remember, but I can't. But they had government funding from the uh, Forest Service. And they were building, uh, they were manufacturing and installing me a mesh network grid in this national forest that was allowing them to put uh, beacons on trucks, uh, like forest service trucks, 
And then no matter where that truck was within the forest, it would ping off of one of these mesh networks. It would ping its beacon off this mesh network and then send that information back across the mesh network. And then these people would be able to identify, oh, it pinged this one, which means the truck is within that area. And so it, it was an asset tracker. And formally, if you're looking to, to find more information on that specifically, it's called the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is, is kind of this concept of, um, you know, being able to make and host and put different peripherals on your, on your own mesh network. Is that concise enough? Yes, it really is. Because cool. um, I, think, I think what we're doing here, and I don't, I don't think I'm wrong. I, I, this, is where, this is where my, I'm not a prophet, but I'm going to make this claim. Gun culture and the gun community is figuring out how to build their own stuff now. They're moving towards further independence. I'm, call, I'm calling it 4.0, and I, I see it as building their own stuff, and you've talked about it as the ideas, and you may uh, lament the 4.0 idea, but I'm calling it 4.0 because, I, in my opinion, what it is is, yes, it's new ideas, but I'm also seeing that we're taking ownership of the manufacturing of our you know, signal intelligence and, and the different electronics we have to interface with that world. It's like Which is okay. exactly why I wanted to talk to you. That's yeah. exactly why. I think I think we're just I think flippers, dude. I hope somebody else out there can like make me feel validated in this. But when Isaac Botkin posted the flipper zero and I got one, everything changed. Like, I don't know what it was, but I just feel like that was just like this ripple because it's like since then I've seen this desire, you know. And of course, there's so many other people. I wish I could list them all off, but Pacific Northwest Comms, the Tactical Balfing, the Tech Prepper, um, all this giant community of like what used to be like fringy radio guys, um, you know, the what is it, the 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 Revenge of the Nerds. It's like they're striking back now, dude. These this small subset of SDR and and ham techs is now like at the core of the development into this technology. They knew it all along. I just figured it out. And I think a lot of other people are starting to figure out like radio frequency is, and the manipulation of that frequency in whatever way is the answer to decentralization because the hams have been owning decentralization since the beginning of time. You know, once they did it away with the CB, the citizens band, and the hams have been going crazy. They've been practicing and they've been making connections 10,000 miles away. Like, they're the guys now who have the ability to control this decentralized comms. And some of them are going rogue and putting up their own repeaters and antennas like on the backs of billboards without FCC authorization, you know. And so there's like this new brand of ham guy that used to be really compliant and used to be very about the book. And it was like, we want to make sure that we follow all the laws, make sure we have a technician's license and all these stuff. And and I think people started to realize, oh, I can find someone's location based on their hand frequency, or I can send a text message over that, or, oh, actually, I don't have to have FCC authority to go put a repeater up, because, like, who's ever really going to find that and be prosecuted on it? That's not advice to go do that, because it is federally illegal, um, but it's possible, you know, and the thing that I always was talking to people about, because I never did get my technician's license, because COVID shut down the testing center whenever I was scheduled to go take it, and I've been too busy to get back into it since, but I fully intend to, and that's actually one of the worst parts about GridBase, is that it's put me more in the hot seat of the device, and relying upon my customer's experience and input to make sure that it does the things that I know it can do, and it's put me less in the seat of being able to become a professional among these things that I, that I would like to be. Um, working on the Venn diagram and trying to get it more to where I can become more of a professional on these different radio aspects. But for now, my, my position is to be within grid base and I can confirm with a hundred percent of surety that it does what I, what I say it does. Um, but yeah, that, that to be an operator now, to be a ham operator is like a very coveted thing. Yeah. It's, it's the push, man. It's these new ideas into decentralization and radio frequency and technology is the way for decentralization. So people are, hacking their Wi-Fi with flipper zeros and, you know, copying RFIDs and um, making mesh networks and coming up with ciphers over bow things. Yeah. That's where we're at. Yeah. This, 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 this comes up quite every once in a while, but it is. Yeah. You look at yeah, the, the people, you look at the people in our country that are, that are capable of violence. They're not the ones participating in it. Oh no. You know, yeah. and there's something to be said about that. Yeah. And any, I think I think I think for I think some people are very confused as to why that's the case. Yeah, for sure. So I think I think some people wonder why. And I mean that in a good way. I mean yeah. I mean there I mean that is in 
we have restraint. Yeah. So, um, it's an interesting point. Let's let's circle back and recenter, and then call it a call it a, call this conversation for the rest of the. Let's wrap it up. So hey, when you begin- I, I, I know what's going to happen. After this, we're going to have a whole subset of, of questions and things. But we need to commit to doing a part two. If, if we end up doing a part two, because there's things that are developing in this sphere. You know, people are talking about open source chat GPT and putting a language learning model inside of Raspberry Pi, and people are already doing it. So, you know, that's very expansive. And you start getting into like, okay, now all of a sudden 10,000 books in a locally hosted repository gets – like that's why would you even need that now? Because we have a language learning model with four billion gigs of compressed internet, and we can ask it anything, anywhere, anytime. So as these things evolve, uh, I want I want to continue the conversation in, in in where we're at. But yes, I do want to wrap it up. But we, we got to do another one because we're, I feel like we're both going to get off this cast and go, man, I meant to ask this or I meant to say this about it or whatever. that is the that is the case. Yes. Yeah. We there. I I know that as soon as I log off, as soon as we're done. There will be something that, but that's the point. Like, yeah, we talk about this all the time, and we people want community, right? right? Like, I get it. You know, it's it's it's. I don't I don't mean to be condescending, but I mean I mean it in this way. Like, there's this way that people talk about friends these days that I find kind of frustrating, and it goes something like this. You know that friend that you have that's willing to criticize you might be a good one to keep around. And it's always and, and what that sentence tells me is that tells me that the person is having is taking a passive approach to who they consider their friends. If yeah. you do not choose your friends, they will be chosen for you and convenience will be the thing that makes the decision. If you do not choose what you believe, if you do not pay attention to what you believe and choose for, you know, choose on what you think about things. If you do not make that choice, it will be chosen for you. Sometimes yeah. the things that choose are not conscious things, but simply the complacency of your mind. Mm. So when it comes to like the, when it comes to community, if you want community and no one is creating one, maybe you have to do it. Yeah. And it's going to suck. It's going <laughs> to be tough, but you will figure it out. Yeah. Sure, there are active attempts to, there may be active uh, efforts to de- uh, atomize the American population, to turn us into, to continue pushing us towards further and further individualization and atomization. Yes, that, that may be the case. It's not an excuse. There are, they are people too. We are people too. So we can make those decisions. But my last question, my kind of closing question is, you opened a little bit of this conversation. You opened this conversation with saying, when I describe my what this thing does, when you describe the grid base, people might not believe you. And we've talked about a lot of its capabilities so far. You have the software to find the SDR element. You have, the, which has both the ability to direction find signals, and then you, know, you can do all these other different things. And that sort of opens up infinitely. Yeah, certainly. You've got uh, location services. You can you can you can turn it into a little bit of a GPS device. Well, it is it has a GPS device. Yeah. Um, it has that it has location capability. It has a communications capability, which we never got into. Right. Um, you know, so you can create well, except for outside of mesh networks. So you can create all of these things go together. It does all of these different things that we find necessary. Kind of like when you think of like. Um, I think the best thing that I can think of is like everything that's important when I'm looking at a HUD in a video game, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like, how do I, how do I communicate with people? How do I do all these kind of stuff? And so. Well, and it, it's, it's ready to grow with you because it's open source. We didn't talk about using it as a drone range extender or a monitor, which is not a feature that I've included on it, but one of my customers really desired that feature. And so they went through and got gathered open source software and, programs themselves and made it to where it does that feature. So we talk about what it does, but then we talk about it being a product that grows with you and, and your needs and your developments because it's open source. We're not dealing with a closed source, limited proprietary thing. We're dealing with a thing that as you've, this whole podcast has been about ideas. We need to be starting ideas and we need to be having these ideas in a way that's beneficial to the community as a whole for a multitude of reasons, because not having ideas is a threat to the growth. 
And so it's like as you have those ideas and as this becomes a something that uh, grows with you, it's it's ready to grow with you. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I, I'll put it this way. There's a there's a conversation that goes on very frequently about what the individual should be able to do and have. Right. You should have a rifle and you should have a handgun. You should know how to use both of them. You yeah. should have a tourniquet and be able to know how to use it. OK, many right. of these things, these things are achievable. They're, they're they totally. are achievable. Right. I, I don't believe that everybody who has a rifle needs to be competition level shooter, competition shooter level capable. But no, they're the suppressive fire guy. No, it's just competent enough and comfortable, competent and capable, right? It's not right. saying that it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It's not saying that that skill set is not valuable. It's it's very valuable, sure. and so we and so part of gun culture has been expanding. And maybe that the 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 what we should expect an American to have is maybe you you should have a rifle and a handgun, you should have a drone and a dirt bike, yeah, you should know how to use them, know how to ride them. And have a way of communicating with your people and the knowledge to fix it and the knowledge to fix it and be able to maintain those things yes mm -hmm. yeah because the open the open source element of this is probably the most intriguing because yeah. now i know i can fix it i it's 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 a it's achievable it's attainable yeah, totally. it's not dependent on sending it to apple to send it to somebody in a foreign country yeah. to you know swap it out so alrighty, yeah. well do you um or do people find out more about it where can they get it how does this yeah, work totally um so we can head down that road i do want to say that uh, first of all i greatly appreciate the opportunity to being on the culture cast you know you've hosted a amazing uh list of people before and it's a very respected platform and so I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be on this platform so thank you for that you provided an awesome space to talk about ideas and leadership and all of the things that need to be talked uh, need to be talked about right now so happy to be a part of that people can find me at gridbase.net that's the website you can uh, email info at gridbase.net um, all the links and everything are on the website of course instagram is gridbase.net spelled out um, and we have a Patreon as well, so the patreon.com slash gridbase. Um, I do a lot more than just the gridbase unit. I also uh, put up STL files and do full build sheets with links to some of uh, different products that didn't work out, like the micro deck, which was a smaller version of this. Uh, one of my customers put it in a dangler and keeps it there. So I don't sell that anymore, but if you want to DIY it um, in the, in the uh, spirit of open source, I've made that available to you. Um, all that stuff can be found on the Instagram or the website. Um, and I do want to thank, you know, all the people that have come before, Jay Dosher, Kiwix, uh, Pacific Northwest, the Tech, the tech Prepper, Tactical Baofeng, uh, all these people who just contributed to this conversation and, and made this possible. Of course, KM4ACK, um, all these people that have just really kind of made this moment a thing, um, owe, owe them a great debt. You know, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. So um, grateful to all of them. And yeah, yeah, that's where you can find me. That's it. I do want to speak to the lastly, there's this little, uh, you know, is it made in America type thing? I'm working on it. Um, you know, I don't know what we're going to do for the computer unit, but for the boxes and the face plates, at least I have sourced an American company that does all of that here. So once we sell through the product that we currently have, we're going to be manufacturing the boxes and the face plates inside of the United States. Um, and of course, it'll always be manufactured here, but working slowly but surely towards getting every single unit manufactured inside the United States while keeping affordability and maintaining profit margins so that everybody wins. Um, it's a core goal of, of what we do and uh, constant improvement, man. Um, you know, the only way out is through and we do not suffer by any accident. So that's it, baby. That's a fantastic way to close the show. So I'm going to in, in that in that being the case, this has been the Redacted Culture Cast. You know where to find us on Spotify because you're listening. You know where to find us on Instagram. That'd be at Redacted LLC. You can find our store at RedactedLLC.com. Now, everything about this show is actually funded by the users at this time. So if you want to give us a, a shout out, please share this show with your friends. Share this communication with the people that you know, because quite frankly, if we uh, the way that we know about it, we could talk about censorship. We could talk about um shadow bands and all that kind of stuff but at the end of the day it, the only way to have community is to build community and sometimes that means just sharing some information and if we were able to provide something for you today that you gained from please share it with somebody else who you think would gain from what we have to talk 
about. So that being said, we will see you soon. This has been the Redacted Culture Cast. Signing out.